So we take plant-based edible materials found in the plants that you already eat, in the peel, in the pulp, in the seeds. We reapply those or repurpose them on the surface of fresh fruits and vegetables to help extend their quality and freshness with the intention to reduce food waste and ultimately create you know, greater abundance for all. So that is like the condensed <laughs> version and super happy to, to dive into that further. Hey folks, I'm Connor Gaughan, and welcome to Consensus in Conversation, a podcast where I talk with leading problem solvers whose sustainable innovations are contributing to the long-term health of humanity and our planet. Today, I'm joined by Jenny Dew, co-founder and senior vice president of business operations at Appeal, a biotechnology startup that's reducing food waste by extending the shelf life of produce. Globally, about a third of all food is thrown away before it can be consumed, and this issue contributes to almost 10% of greenhouse gas emissions. Jenny and the team at Appeal were struck by the sheer scale of this phenomenon and recognized that any solution would be double powerful because it would address the interconnected problems of food insecurity and climate change. To unlock the significant impact, Jenny would harness the same inquisitive nature that led her to become a first-generation college student and earn a PhD. She was able to ask the right guiding questions, which helped Appeal discover that most plants are already protected from decomposition by a natural defensive layer, or peel. So they realized that strengthening these natural barriers could help fruits and vegetables stay fresher longer, be properly consumed, and avoid landfills. Jenny and Appeal are testaments to the innovative potential of sustainable sectors, and I can't wait to learn more about her problem-solving prowess. So, let's get started. Give us a little bit of your backstory. Where, Where are you from originally? Sure. I am born and raised in Canada. So a very proud Canadian, which is a very anti-Canadian kind of thing to say, (laughs) to be a word about that, maybe. Born in Saskatchewan, a little kind of tiny place called Shaunavan, Saskatchewan. And my family moved to Calgary when I was about four years old. Ultimately ended up going to school, uh, doing an engineering degree and a PhD in chemistry on the eastern part of Canada at Queen's University. And then after graduate school, made my way to Santa Barbara for postdoctoral research, uh, looking to kind of change the area that I was focused in. I was enjoying what I was doing in graduate school, but um, was getting really excited about a different, like emerging field of technology around these flexible, like solar materials for low-cost energy, and I didn't have any experience in that at all. So I was looking really for programs in the U.S. and Canada that were strong in that, and that's what led me to Santa Barbara due to their really strong materials program. Once I arrived, I was given a very, very different project in a very different scope. I'm working on actually microorganisms and uh, no longer on those flexible solar cells. But what was great about my time in Santa Barbara, amongst many things, was the opportunity to meet ultimately, um, our founding team. Yeah, well, we can dig in on that a little bit. Was entrepreneurship something big in your family? Was it, Were you destined to be a co-founder of a startup? No. <laughs> uh, yes, I would say maybe <laughs> yes and no. Um, and the reason why I say that is, you know, my parents, we are of Chinese descent, but we've been, I would say, like, generationally running away from communism for a little bit. So, you know, my parents were born in Vietnam as a result of that, and uh, I'm born in Canada also as a result of that. And so growing up, a lot of, I would say the value system was around like a path that would give you stability. And I think also to what my parents could and our family could understand, like my father has only made it to sixth grade of education before he, as the oldest in his family, had to go, you know, work to help support the family. My mother finished high school, but certainly, like, it is myself and our and my generation of, of relatives, siblings and relatives that are the first to really pursue some kind of post-secondary education. So we're a very blue-collar family. Uh, moving to Canada, you know, starting off, we were sponsored by this community in this tiny rural town. So it was very much around actually farming and agriculture and the machinery that would go into doing that. 
so my parents uh, went down this path of like say like welding basically and so so much of our time growing up was about hey like study hard so that you don't have to have a life that's been let's say like as hard a work physical work as we've had but that also created a lot of tension like for me personally I would say it's linked also to growing up in this like a very traditional and like Eastern culture versus what I kind of grew up in from school and exposure to friends and everything here through Western culture. And also seeing that, um, you know, I think for my parents, it was very much, you know, if you go to school to study this thing, then after you're done school, you will continue to do that thing. And it's a very either linear path and certainly like a more like white collar path, let's say for traditional careers. So for me to go to graduate school and my father was like, okay, well, you're going to do that for a while. Like, then what do you do after that? And I was like, well, I'm still not really sure, you know, and then you go and do a postdoc and he's like, well, what's that, you know? And so there's just no reference points for that. And and I understand that. But in a weird way, though, they've, they were all entrepreneurs when they were younger. I just don't think they like ever realized that, you know, like a lot of my, my grandparents, their businesses where they were their own shopkeepers and, you know, like managing their own businesses. So uh, it's so funny because my father thinks of it as this like high risk endeavor, especially early on when I was kind of early in this path. And I was like, you guys like, You've seen way more, way more stuff than I will ever probably have to face in my life. I was like, what are you talking about? (laughs) Yeah. Took some big risks, I assume, to to move to Canada. Yeah. Yeah. So I think also like you're in a traditional academic path. Um, I think times may have changed now, but when I was going through graduate school, you know, it was either you were going to pursue an academic career to be a research professor, for example, or teach. Or you would go and do R&D in a large company. And those were kind of like the two primary fields that were either held up and celebrated in any way. And it was through the a really wonderful interaction with a mentor who shared her path, becoming an entrepreneur much later in her career, and just seeing that like, hey, this isn't really talked about with a lot of folks. And I think it was really fortunate that she saw in me like things I just couldn't have had any reference point to recognize in myself, which was a high level of um, tolerance for like ambiguity and risk. And, you know, maybe more of like a generalist and sort of people skill set that in that time when you're just starting from zero, like, how would you shape something out of that and and find a way? So I really, I guess, benefited from that mentorship, because it would not have been a path I would have otherwise uh, been aware of. It's amazing. That's a theme that I've really hooked onto this season. I've, we've talked a lot with folks who can pinpoint the mentors that helped expose them to, you know, the path that they ultimately ended up on in building or leading new companies. It seems like a, something we hear a lot in these interviews. Yeah, I, there's. I would say there's a, a few handful of those pivotal moments in your life that you can like remember the time and the place and the tone, and yeah. it carries with you. And and it's also the thing that. It's like your why for why you want to pass that on to someone else because of how pivotal uh, that moment was. Was there a single conversation with your mentor that kind of uh, just opened your eyes or the light bulb went off? It was a particular conversation where she shared her own story of being a very highly decorated academic achiever through her graduate degree and having this like preeminent fellowship in hand for postdoctoral work. And um, that when she kind of tuned back into kind of what she wanted, circumstances in her life at the time that propelled her to choose a different path, it's just as she opened herself up to that and asked herself some additional questions. It really helped me break down. I think I'd always felt a little bit out of place in an academic environment. I can share an anecdote even about that. So as a graduate student, Myself and a couple of the other my peers in my cohort in graduate school in the same research lab, you know, two of them had uh, won this award in a previous year, and then there was a follow-on year where I won the award, and I just felt like such an imposter. I vividly remember the conversation where I apologized to the two of them 
that somehow my having received that, like, almost, like, lessened, like, I was, like, apologizing in case it lessened theirs. And they looked at me like I had, you know, four heads <laughs> um, because they're such, you know, dear friends and supporters. But I think this environment of hyper-specialized, deep knowledge and certainly upholding individuals as star students. And I think that just never felt like it was me. Like I'm good at, I think, a variety of different things and piecing things together, but not in a single person sort of being outstanding and shining away. That's at least not how I I view myself, certainly. And um, you always feel like you're living to these expectations that like are not a match to you (laughs) Uh, and to your value system. And I think this conversation with the mentor really helped me tune back into not just what others may expect of me, but what really resonates with me personally. Uh, And to just provide this space and to allow you to be courageous enough to explore that. And I think in sitting with that for a while, how strongly that resonated and gave me the courage, I think, to take a, a very different decision. And like, lo and behold, I remember ultimately like sharing my decision with my parents. And my dad said, well, if it doesn't work, I guess you can always try something else. And I was like, aliens have <laughs> taken my parents. <laughs> and But when sometimes when you have the moment, you're like, I'm not going to ask any more questions. Just take it and run with it. And um, anyway, so yeah. here we are now. <laughs> and it really does, it does open us up to whatever may come our way next in, in profound ways. I want to get back to science and, and the, the appeal in a second. But I found in conversations with founders, many of us, and I can remember my own moments, have, especially early on, have that imposter syndrome and... For many, I think there's a moment where like, wait a second, yeah, this is this is my company and this is what we're doing and and I do know what I'm doing. Did you kind of find a way to overcome that moment you felt in academia when you moved into the world of startups? Yes and no. <laughs> this is a better fit. While it's very difficult for me to pinpoint very specifically, you know, people say like, what are your strengths? Like, what are you good at? It's a very awkward question. But I do know that if you put a problem in front of me, I will find a way to solve it. It's not because I know the answer, but I can enlist <laughs> the help of others. I can be resourceful. I think I can ask good questions to drive towards that. So it has been through that experiential side of it, let's say, that I've developed over the years, just more of an assurance around that. And I don't know if I don't let it go because it's maybe a thing that has helped me be successful to some extent is that that fear of if you wonder if you know enough and if you're good enough keeps you constantly striving for more. So it's like very double-edged. And just to add a little bit more color to this, you know, so you, you join the company and every, every it's an idea on the on a napkin. So there's no nothing to show for it yet. You know, the small group of us, we're all everyone's in the lab and everyone's doing like whatever needs to get done. And that goes on for a while. And my role is uh very technical at the outset. Uh, again, because there's no there's no product in hand. About a couple years in, James, our CEO and and founder, like uh, pulls me aside and goes, okay. You're now in charge of operations. And I just looked at him like, what the hell is that? Like, that's not anything <laughs> you were ever taught was a thing in school. Like, right. what, what do you mean? So I just remember like Googling, like, what is operations? And then you get a super <laughs> non-helpful definition, right. which is it is kind of what is left over in depending on the structure of your company after all these other parts are taken. And it can kind of, you know, ebb and flow depending on where you are. And I was like, okay, this is a create my own adventure, you know? So, <laughs> um, but anyways, as the role has evolved and the needs of the company have evolved over time, you 
have this healthy insecurity that you go like, I don't know enough, you know, that I ultimately I can get my job done. But that fear, (laughs) that imposter is pretty much always there. You just try to figure out how to like make it your friend instead of wholly your foe. Yeah. So let's get to Appeal. Give us the elevator pitch for those that might not know what Appeal is and what Appeal does. Sure. So we take plant-based edible materials found in the plants that you already eat, in the peel, in the pulp, in the seeds. We reapply those or repurpose them on the surface of fresh fruits and vegetables to help extend their quality and freshness with the intention to reduce food waste and ultimately create you know, greater abundance for all. So that is like the condensed yeah. <laughs> version and super happy to, to dive into that further. I'd love to hear the early days. Give us the origin story. Yeah. Food waste is a hotter topic, let's say, in, in more recent years. But back in 2012, uh, which is the year in which the company was incorporated, I would say it was pretty much like news, like new on the scene. And so the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN had put out a report talking about global food loss and waste rates. And it's just a staggering amount that, unfortunately, worldwide, we really haven't made a lot of progress against, which is basically that you know almost half of the food that we produce ends up going to waste before there's a chance for it to be consumed. It was, like, stunning to hear that, and it was really James who had come across that revelation and, and would, would say, like, took the first, like, steps along that. So it just started off with some, I would call them like naive but simple questions because we didn't, this is not a, a world we came from. It's like, why do plants spoil today? Like, what are the drivers of that? And you can have things like water evaporating out of that produce, exposure to oxygen in the environment that's causing this oxidation, maybe biological stressors. What technologies are there today after harvest to extend or maintain the shelf life. And what we found is that it's actually not as extensive as the tools that are available pre-harvest. There's a heavy, heavy reliance on refrigeration and the cold chain, which we also know is not accessible or readily available in all markets around the world. Yeah, globally, yeah. It just seemed like there was an opportunity for some additional innovation in that post-harvest space. We focus more on that water loss and oxidation side, not so much um, kind of combating things like uh, like fungal pressure or anything like that. And we started to ask, how do plants protect themselves against the environment? And all of us, like plants included, you know, we, we have a skin, like yeah. a, a peel. And its purpose <laughs> is really to help us like retain moisture, <laughs> reduce, you know, oxidative exposure, when it's healthy, it's a good barrier to the stuff in the outside world and, and it can be like an indicator, you know, of other stuff that's going on. So that's really where this like, okay, what's in the peel? Like what are these like biological structural building blocks that plants uh, use to protect themselves and can we use those, like just almost use them to reinforce, you know, the surface that's that's already there. Because certainly you want the latest technology in your latest uh, mobile phone, but that's not what folks necessarily want on their food. So it's where then the vision to work with nature rather than against nature, using materials and mechanisms that are already found there, and then like repurposing them, you know, redeploying them in this way. As you oversaw extraction engineering, which I think is what you're talking about, can you just give give us a little bit of how you got to those answers and perhaps in layman's terms to the extent possible. (laughs) Yeah, sure. There was a a really beautiful scientific paper that had been put out actually examining that peel, uh, this cuticle layer of a tomato, basically. And as you dug into it and you go like, okay, what is that material made out of? What are the building blocks of that? So then a lot of the early extraction work was, I mean, it's like so crazy to think about now. It's like, go to the grocery store, buy a bunch of tomatoes. <laughs> See if you can break it down. You know, what would you isolate from it? It's one thing when they're intact, you know, in their final form. 
But once you blow it all apart and you try to put it back together, you know, does it still work the same way? So, I mean, that's kind of like the the path that we went down. And it, it led us to this family of, of lipid, like fatty acid type materials. I think I'm probably getting too far off the layman's side. But uh, yeah, I mean, it really came to a scientific work, scientific literature that sort of um, confirmed, let's say, the presence of, of these materials, and specifically in this setting with the peel, then us going to try to isolate those same materials to then be able to see, you know, would they behave in our application in the same way, which is very different from, you know, let's say enzymatically being grown <laughs> on the plant, you know, right, as part of like a growing piece of fruit. Was tomatoes where it started? Is your first example? It started there for um, extraction discovery purposes. And, you know, when we were looking for feedstocks, it was a very circuitous way to leading us to um, like a local grower who had these exotic finger limes, these caviar limes. And he had said, hey, like they lose their color very quickly after they're picked. They're still perfectly good and usable on the inside, but they're not marketable anymore. Like if your product could actually extend that natural health of, of the appearance of the peel, that could really like be really helpful to me because otherwise I'm overnight shipping these to the other side of the country, you know, trying to get them there without having the skin break down. So we were a little bit all over as far as, you know, trying to find um, like an early demonstration or proof of concept that the product could work. It has been 11 years now. As you've mentioned, food waste is is something that certainly is getting a lot more attention around the country. Talk to us about the growth of the appeal. Like, how, how did you get from ideation and proof of concept to 10 years later in a hot market where you guys are today? Yeah, it's almost come full circle. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but but not to the exact same place. So, I mean, when we started, so we we have got this you know, these plant-based materials that we know are found kind of ubiquitously. And we had demonstrated, especially on those finger limes to start, like, hey, this could actually work. (laughs) And so we approached other suppliers. We call them suppliers. After produce is harvested from the field, it kind of comes to this centralized facility where it can be sorted for size and color and any other defects. And so those are packers, you know, packing houses. So these kind of grower packers, we had approached them first and said, hey, like we've got something that can help your produce last longer. Depending on who you spoke to early on, it was a very early insight into like, whoa, the way the system works and the incentives like may not be wholly aligned here. Sometimes we hear like, well, the trash can is my best friend. After I send it to somebody and it's received by uh, the buyer, what happens to it after that is kind of no longer something we have visibility to nor are really responsible for. But the more they may need to throw away, the more they may need to come back and buy more. And so that's definitely not the a response we had anticipated <laughs> like early on. So you worked down that path for a while, and we found some early adopters um, who, let's say, believed in offering a higher quality product offering and felt like that was something that could be differentiating for them and help them competitively. But that's definitely not the you know the mindset of, of all that we had spoken to early on. And so then from there, uh, we started actually speaking a little bit more to the retailers directly. Because you'd also say, like, well, this seems interesting, but, you know, will my customer buy it? So we kind of had to come at it from both sides. It just started off, we started off with avocados, doing these basically pilot programs with a few um, smaller regional retailers. And that helped us get the early case studies, you know, or the proof points. Um, And it was amazing. It was the waste rate in store for avocados was reduced by 50% after they had introduced appeal-protected avocados. And that was very helpful then for sharing that story with others. But then what we learned over time is like not everyone either has a waste problem or it's not their biggest problem. And so 
we may not be able to continue to sell our product based on a waste reduction proposition alone. So we started to ask questions more about like, well, how else would someone use the availability of more time? (laughs) And so is that uh, related to other operating efficiencies, you know, internally um, that relieve the pressure on the supply chain? And certainly when you think about the supply chain pressures during that, you know, COVID, COVID, kind of peak COVID period. Yeah. And how disruptive that was, it was like, wow, is there ways in which like a little more slack to the system could be beneficial? Or maybe somebody else who, you know, we would love to be able to merchandise more. There's certainly a an underconsumption of fresh produce, like globally, (laughs) like less than a third of us meet our actual daily nutritional intake requirements for fresh produce consumption, for example. (laughs) That would be me, yeah. uh, So folks were like, hey, we'd love a chance to be able to like, you know, just, um, you know, just drive sales, but drive consumption of these, of these, in the growth of these categories. You know, so there was just all these different levers that um, have emerged over the course of our time. But so I would say that's the, some of the aspects of the commercial trajectory and the learnings along the way. Then on the other side of it has been, you know, what does it mean to actually integrate your technology into a packing house environment. What does it mean when at first they're kind of like, we kind of want you here, but we kind of don't want you here, so we're going to put you in the corner, versus, hey, I think this could be a lot more efficient if we're really integrated in the core of your operation rather than being literally like extra handling because we're <laughs> we're, we're an appendage. And so that's kind of, I would say, that what the commercial growth means, like the operating learnings have been. Uh, or like operating and technology side. The ways in which we also had to grow up really fast was, um, you know, fresh produce is this seasonal offering. And so to be able, you know, a retailer that would like to have like a peel protected produce in their stores, they don't source from just one supplier. Uh, They don't source even just from one region, depending on the time of the year. So very quickly, we also had to grow to accommodate these global fresh produce supply chains in order to provide a year-round supply. So I think compared to other companies which may have an opportunity to really mature in a given market, iron a lot of stuff out, and then figure out, okay, how do we replicate that in a new region, but everyone's got that operating experience under their belt. We had to go and stand that up simultaneously a few different places all at the same time. Yeah. So we're trying to like operate and then also try to operate as like a global organization right. at the same time. Scale immediately. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, listening to you talk about the path of produce from you know agricultural product to sitting on my table. Okay, so it gets picked, it goes to the packing house, it goes to the retailer, it goes to my house. A, there's four different points of potential waste right there, depending on, you know, it needs to meet the requirements for each one of those steps to get to the next step. And inherent in that is a timeline that, to your point, begins to degrade everything immediately also. Like, you begin to understand pretty quickly the magnitude of of the opportunity slash problem that Appeal is trying to solve. Just taking a half a second to think about, you know, how we live our lives. It, I hate to think about how many avocados or lemons or limes I have probably had to get rid of this year alone, but it's not an insignificant amount. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's like, there are studies out there that suggest, you know, an average um, American household, you can be throwing away like $1,500 a year. And for some people, that's yeah. maybe not a big deal. And for other people, that's like a it's huge, huge deal. Yeah. It also is a reminder, as we think about how Appeal really is building a, a business that is doing good in the world while while being tremendously successful, that there's actually a couple different opportunities for building a better world in, in this process. Like, it's building a more resilient supply chain. It's decreasing food waste. It's, as a consequence, potentially decreasing food insecurity on a global level. All these things, I think, are... Um, Positive externalities that we could associate with these kinds of this kind of solution. I'm curious from your perspective and Appeal's kind of point of view. How do you guys think about sustainability relative to your mission uh, as an organization? Yeah, how do you provide for 
the needs today without taking away from the ability to do that tomorrow is kind of like, let's say, one of the operating definitions of sustainability out there, but one that has certainly resonated with us. And the way that we've tried to distill that a little bit further into what does that mean in appeals context and where we can have an impact really started with food waste first and foremost. Um, There are supply chain efficiencies. There are, for example, the opportunity to reduce the use of single-use plastic. So one of the Appeals products is to replace that shrink wrap, plastic wrap that goes over English cucumbers, for example, um, because you can use our edible material um, but have the equivalent or better shelf life, for example. Another thing I wanted to layer on beyond our external impacts, internally, like how do we take decisions, like uh, business and operating decisions related to Um, our product, our services, et cetera, with that sustainability lens as well. So we wanted very deeply to not have sustainability values be something that would be like just greenwashing, just lip service to something. And so with really great work from our sustainability team members that we had brought in um, over time, it was to really say, you know, how do you use something like a life cycle assessment that really looks at almost like the total carbon and resource footprint so that in how Appeals products are sourced, manufactured, packaged, transported, applied, that would not offset the benefit, for example, of food waste or plastic reduction and so on and so forth. So in addition to the those external impacts we want, we've really built sustainability into how we think about what we do internally in order to deliver the products and services. When you think about the example you gave earlier of the misalignment of incentives with the packing houses, for example, besides going around them to the retailers and having the retailers engage in the process, have you noticed any of those agents or participants kind of rethinking their perspective and and, and beginning to understand the potential long-term profit potential of a lengthening shelf life of, of their produce? Or have, have you had any adoption or, or noticed any adoption shifts there? And I'm curious if you have, what you think got people there? Yeah. This really is maybe what I was trying to foreshadow with like your growth question. I was like, in some ways we've come full circle. <laughs> <laughs> and I totally understand and empathize with the questions that were being asked around like very early on. Because we're just, we're just unknown entity. In the path that we've gone so far, you know, getting the retailer also engaged and excited about appeal, seeing how that could benefit their businesses, and then using that to like align the suppliers, you know, along with that. What it's given us ultimately is the opportunity to demonstrate like the technology works. <laughs> and, you know, with that and over the years having developed a greater awareness, you know, within the industry to appeal, what we're doing, how we're doing it, what we're all about. And then, of course, the demonstrated results, you know, from a, hey, it's been in a couple people's hands now for quite some time. You know, they can really actually pull back samples of uh, peel-protected produce versus not protected and, like, see the difference over time. Like, it's, you know, seeing is believing. Some of the existing supplier partners then are going like, hey, I'd actually love to take advantage of that additional time in other ways. Like I'm, I'm trying to reach other markets, you know, where on that long transport, there can be a lot of waste for like a, an overseas you know, shipping freighter. So that's been really great. I think in some cases with the partners that are within our, we say our supplier ecosystem today that are already using Appeal, getting comfortable with, let's say your V1 <laughs> offering or your value proposition, but actually seeing how more time could be beneficial. As we approach or engage with new potential customers, us just having been out in the market now for a few years makes us lesser of that unknown entity. (laughs) And then we've been making changes along the way to also be just, we say, like easier to work with. How do we integrate a lot more seamlessly and operationally efficiently, but also cost effectively um, with them? And so that's, uh, I think, really changing the sentiment, you know, as we kind of let's say, like, go into this new phase of appeals, like, life cycle or trajectory. Yeah. 
What are you most excited about for the next chapter of Appeal? Oof. For us, uh, the foundation of what we've built so far has been based on the on our edible protection. And there's ways in which that we're excited for that to evolve too. Like, you know, how could you, for example, potentially reduce the need to use the more harmful traditional like post-harvest fungicides or pesticides that might be used in the fresh produce supply chain today? Again, going back to working with nature, with, you know, materials that are found, again, in the plants that we already eat (laughs) that could help that. And then the second piece that I would layer on to that has been in order for us to have validated our product's performance or the, you know, the efficacy of the technology, we've done a lot of work to amass a lot of data around produce and produce quality. And we won't be the only ones to say this, but there's traditionally been opacity in the supply chain. Like these nodes are more isolated from each other. So like a a, a packing house will tell us like, hey, after it makes its way to the retailer and certainly to the end consumer, like we don't really get a lot of feedback <laughs> about how this product is performing there and you know what other attributes would be important and so on and so forth. So I guess we, we're embarking down this path of say like digitizing produce quality. And so different like data and software tools that just make more of the invisible more visible to players in the supply chain. Again, with the goal of being able to offer produce that's both more available, desirable, and reliable. <laughs> so. I love that. And uh, when you think about where, where you're at, I'm curious what motivates you every day to, to jump out of bed and keep doing this? Oh, I'll share maybe what got me excited in the first place because it's still what keeps me excited today. Sure. Um, when approached early on, you know, about like joining on, you know, with with Appeal, uh, like in you know, a conversation with James and also another co-founder, uh, Lou, I just remember being like, wow, if I think about what's important to me, I want to work on a meaningful problem. One that, you know, if we could somehow figure it out, that is what I would want to spend my time doing. You know, so it was a meaningful problem. I am a science and engineering nerd at heart. So I love that it's a it's a technical challenge. And early on I was like I would I how cool to build a company culture just from the ground up. In all the ways you hope, let's say in learning from the good and the bad of the other things you had seen up until that point in your life, you know, how would you do it differently if you had the chance to? And those are all the same things today, even to like entertain the thought of like, well, what else would I be working on if not appeal? And it's like, like the base of the pyramid, like how do we feed the world and be really feel good about like, we want people to eat more fresh fruits and vegetables. (laughs) Like it's really good for us on a lot of different fronts. Um, How do you make that more possible, especially in light of the, the mounting challenges and then learning certainly every day, you know, the problems it's never perfectly solved. And as soon as you take that mountain, there's some other thing that's waiting for you. And we are very fortunate. We have incredible people at Appeal, like just purely good humans who also, when they are at work, are good humans (laughs) (laughs) with each other. And um, it's it's actually something I'm really, really proud of is um, Nobody's spending just eight hours of their day at work, like realistically, you know, 40 hours a week. And even if you were, that's such a significant proportion of your life. And so how do you create a place where people wake up and they're proud and excited to go to work and be surrounded by those people working on that problem together? It's almost like if none of the rest of this works out, like that is such... I feel like an important thing to be able to create or make space for, to give to others, you know? So I think what's been really helpful for us over the course of this past year, because it's also been a a tough year, 2022 is a very challenging year, you know, for appeal for a lot of companies, you know, going through trying to navigate this sort of macroeconomic environment coupled with, you know, any kind of growing pains you needed to sort out internally. Coming out the other side of that and just 
some reflection and asking myself, like, what's my purpose in life? There's nothing grandiose about it. You just sort of strip it all away to what is core and fundamental and just here to to spread spread love. <laughs> you know, create these interactions, whether fleeting or persistent, with folks that you may come across that just brings out the best in the moment and the people involved so that we can go and do great work together. I really love this quote from Steve Jobs. It's just really about like change is only ultimately affected by those who just are crazy enough to believe that they they can be the ones to do that. Um, And that's really stuck with me. And so that's, I guess, what I try to do is as far as seeding every day where I can. Big thanks to Jenny for this awesome conversation. Consensus and Conversation is hosted by me, Connor Gaughan. The episode is produced by Will Gatchell and Jeff Rock. Executive produced by me with editing from Reasonable Volume. Special thanks to Consensus Creative Director Kate Tucker and strategist Patrick Gallagher. Don't forget to like and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. We'll see you next week.